Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a new event organized by the Observatorio de la Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas en los Estados Unidos, uh, which, as many of you uh, know already, is a research center, which is a joint project uh, between the Instituto Cervantes and Harvard University. One of the observatorio's main areas of study is languages and cultures in contact within which we pay special attention to the coexistence of Spanish with English and with minority languages in the US and in Latin America, as well as to social identity, demographic, political, and economic factors which affect the various speak Spanish speaking communities in the US. We are therefore very interested also in the diasporic communities of Andean uh, migrants whose Quechua Spanish bilingualism or trilingualism becomes particularly complex and interesting when they move to the US and their native Quechua language or Spanish has to coexist with English. To talk about the, this fascinating topic and particularly about the social, education, political, and identity issues affecting these communities in the US, we are very fortunate to have as our guest speaker today, a real expert in the Quechua languages and communities, which he has studied from various perspectives. Dr. Américo Mendoza Amori, who has recently joined Harvard University as a lecturer in Latinx studies at the committee of ethnicity, migration and rights at Harvard. This talk therefore is another example of the fruitful collaboration between uh, the Observatorio and the EMR committee at Harvard. I am really pleased therefore to briefly introduce Dr. America Mendoza Mori to you all, who's an interdisciplinary uh, scholar trained in literary, linguistic and cultural studies with a BA from the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos in Lima, Peru, and a PhD from the University of Miami in Florida. Before joining Harvard, Dr. Mendoza Mori took on innovative leadership roles. For example, he was the founder and coordinator of the University of Pennsylvania's Quechua program. He was co-founder of the Quechua Alliance and co-founder as well of the International Conference of, for Thinking Andean Studies. He has also been, he has also been a, con, a, a cultural consultant for theater and film, including Paramount Pictures movie, Dora and the Lost City of Gold in 2019. <clears throat> and he's been involved in educational and community-based initiatives in Peru, in Ecuador, in Bolivia, and in the, in the United States. At Harvard, he is currently faculty director of the Latinx Studies Working Group at EMR, and uh, he teaches courses here. He teaches courses on transnational cultural studies, education and language, and critical Latinx indigeneities. For example, he's currently teaching a, a, a course on, which I find fascinating, on indigeneity and Latinidad. His research focuses on Latin America, US Latinx and indigenous issues. And he's published in various prestigious academic um, journals. He has also presented his research at the United Nations and he has also been featured in other uh, uh, contexts like uh, the New York Times, a TEDx talk or NPR. I'll just mention a couple of chapters for you to have a, an idea of his research, which are very, <clears throat> closely connected to the topic today. For example, Lenguas y Culturas Originarias en la Construcción de Identidades, Las Oportunidades del Quechua, or Quechua Language Program in the United States, Cultural Hubs for Indigenous Cultures. So welcome, Americo. Thank you very much indeed for accepting our invitation. Your talk has attracted a, very, a really large audience so uh, we are very pleased to have you here. Thank you everybody again. And I leave you with America's talk. You have the floor now. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, uh, Martinez Bartolomé. And thank you for the Cervantes Observatory at Harvard. It's a, it's a true pleasure to 
join um, this space and and I'm happy to share with all of you who are connected uh, are, and watching this talk. Uh, so, so hopefully we can also have a fruitful conversation. Um, before I start with my talk, uh, Global and Migrant Indigeneity, Quechua Language Reclamation in the United States, I also wanted to uh, follow uh, a land acknowledgement provided by the Harvard University Native American program, which acknowledges that Harvard University is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of, of, what, is no, uh, of, of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. Uh, we pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself in which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. Imainaya and Kashankichis, Noka Amerikokani, Kunami Kusitha Kachkani, Kaipunchai Uruna Sinimanta Rimasa. Hello, everyone. As I mentioned before, my name is Americo Mendoza Mori, and, and today I'm going to talk about Quechua uh, in a migrant context. And for that, I would like to start this talk um, introducing you or reintroducing you to an iconic Andean uh, thinker and writer and intellectual. His name is Jose Maria Arguedas. Oh, and, and, and before I do that, I just want to mention that some of the ideas that are shared uh, for this presentation are part of a forthcoming article along with my colleague, Rachel Sprouse, um, named Hemispheric Quechua, Language Education and Reclamation within Diasporic Communities in the US, and from an already published article that uh, was uh, quoted before. Being said that, I would like to start this presentation with Jose Maria Arguedas, a thinker, scholar, and intellectual from the Andes, known for bringing very important conversations on, on multiculturality and the complexity of um, navigating different identities, uh, specifically in the case of Quechua and Spanish. And he was a very um, groundbreaking scholar and it's still very relevant. His work um, it can be found in novels such as Deep Rivers, Los Rios Profundos, or uh, The Fox from Up Above and The Fox from Down Below, below uh, El Zorro de Arriba y El Zorro de Abajo. And in this last uh, piece, um, he also talks about his own experience traveling the world. And when he talks about being in New York City, this is what he says. He says that he never, never feeling more like an outsider and also never happier. Maybe that can be the first way to start to dive into this complexity of migrant and indigenous communities. Maybe feeling a mix of feeling at, at odd but at the same time, pushing for not just um, surviving, but for thriving into those spaces. And even though today we're talking about Quechua, it's important to mention that this situation can be exemplified by other migrant communities. As the original inhabitants of the Americas, indigenous communities resist and thrive across the hemisphere, despite the dynamics of colonization that still affect their existence and ways of living. Many prejudices affect these communities, sometimes perceived as timeless and quote unquote pure subjects, when in reality adaptation and migration have been a constant characteristic for many of these groups. Recognizing the diversity of these indigenous and Latinx communities across the United States and their migration processes and current aims could be a, um, is, is certainly a way to enrich the conversations on 
Latinidad or Hispanic studies as well. So I, uh, even though I won't cover this today, I just want to acknowledge the presence of other migrant communities from Latin America, both in urban and rural areas. For instance, Oaxaca, California, the Mistec Zapotec community in Los Angeles County, the Guatemala and Maya neighborhoods in South Florida and California, transnational communities in what is now the US-Mexico border, or the Quechua, Quechua language speaking groups of Andean heritage in the Washington DC, Miami and New York areas. In this piece, speaking about Quechua, I hope to draw experiences as a US-based Quechua language educator and organizer to explore the participation of diasporic Quechua reclamation movements in the global advance of the language. This framing of US-based projects, not as discrete entities, but as initiatives in constant connection with their counterparts in the Andes. This reflection piece provides um, a timeline of academic and community organizations, mostly in New York City, home to the largest bilingual Quechua Spanish communities outside of the Andes. And I'm hoping to, uh, as a wrap up, to conclude that these diasporic bottom up language policy and planning efforts are natural agents of dialogue on Quechua language education and therefore an integral part of the international Quechua reclamation movement. Many of you might be aware already of Quechua, and maybe for some of you, this, this might be the first time. So I want to provide some general context. Quechua is the most widely spoken indigenous language family in the Americas, with millions of speakers in Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador, and substantial numbers in Argentina, Chile, and Colombia. Quechua is also known as Runasimi, which um, means the language or the mouth of the people. Since the European invasion of South America in the early 16th century, ongoing colonial violence has altered the status of the language and its speakers. Back then, Quechua was thriving and it quickly became the subject of systematic study for evangelical purposes in the vice royalty of Peru. Grammar texts and dictionaries were written and students at, for instance, my, my alma mater, San Marcos University in Lima, were even required to have some knowledge of Quechua or Aymara, the other major Andean language, in order to graduate from the university. Then during the 18th century, Spain's Bourbon reforms created a more centralized colonial system that resulted in indigenous uprisings. Just to show some images, these are some publications from the 17th century in Spanish that incorporate a uh, Quechua uh, language and also traditions. On top of that, there were also some uh, grammars that were published in the 16th and 17th century. But then in the 18th century, protests against the crown, the Spanish crown, generated fear and led to the eventual provision of Quechua and Andean languages and bodies of knowledge. In 1758, for example, the Spanish crown banned Quechua from public schools in Peru and the Andes along with the famous te text that you can see in this slide, Comentarios Reales, a work penned in 1609 by the renowned chronicle Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, or El Inca, as he was also known. The book captures stories of the Andean people, their worldview, and their relationship with nature. Following South America's independence in the 19th century, the situation of Quechua did not improve. In Peru, Lima's criollo elite, made up of white descendants of the Spaniards, expropriated indigenous lands and revoked privilege the Spanish crown had granted to Inca nobility and their descendants. 
Similar events occurred in Ecuador and Bolivia, two other new countries with important indigenous populations. Therefore, without an indigenous economic and social elite, it was easier to overlook and even denigrate indigenous peoples while taking their lands. Still, as Marisol de la Cadena points out, during that century, I'm quoting, Lima and Cusco vied for national leadership. Limeños proudly identified themselves with Catholic views, formal education in Spanish, and coastal access, whereas the Cusqueño political class argued that they had a deeper and more authentic nationalism rooted in pre-Hispanic Inca heritage and verified by the regional elite proficiency in the Quechua language, end of quote. In this context, during the second half of the 19th century, a few criollo intellectuals started to speak out about the question indígena, idealizing, sometimes even exoticizing, indigenous heritage. During the early 20th century, an intellectual movement called indigenismo took root. This movement, which highlighted the importance of indigenous heritage and languages, stood in contrast, in contrast to the age when indigenous, um, sorry, stood in contrast to the age when um, indigenous cultural knowledge were considered nearly worthless for national identity. Indigenismo also ushered in a period marked by numerous major archaeological discoveries, such as those of Machu Picchu, the lost city, which is now a major touristic destination, and the Nazca Lines. Additionally, it was during this period, with the commencement of Peru's president Augusto Leguía, and the creation of the 1920 constitution, that the first laws that protected indigenous lands appeared. Quechua languages were not officially recognized until the Peruvian military government of Juan Velasco Alvarado, which was in 1975. Peru was the first Andean country to recognize Quechua, followed by Bolivia in 1977 and Ecuador 2008. Still, social stigmatization and discrimination have prompted large-scale language shift from Quechua to Spanish. As a result, Quechua speakers often lack access to essential services in their language, such as education, healthcare, and social justice. As Quechua scholar Serafín Coronel Molina affirms, indigenous people are perceived as the other and provided few opportunities. Such circumstances prompted relocation from rural to urban areas and migration to other cities in the mid 20th century. Many speakers now live in Andean cities such as Cochabamba, Cusco, Lima, or Quito, using Quechua in bilingual contexts as um, Rosalind Howard um, mentions in many of her work thereby expanding its use into urban environments and diverse places. Currently, the city of Lima, Peru's capital, is the city with the biggest amount of Quechua speakers around the world, are, uh, which the numbers go for about half a million people. Over the last two decades, various language reclamation initiatives have taken hold in the Andes, including television shows, music, social media, and government policies for language inclusion. These youth-led projects celebrate indigenous cultures and challenge the stereotypes that associate Quechua with rural areas, poverty, and ignorance. Virginia Zavala argues, argues that these young Andes-based language activists are, I'm quoting, trying to use Quechua and debate about the language in urban spaces with a conscious and overt stance towards social change and the contestation of official language ideologies. And two examples of that um, in the Andean region are uh, the singers Renata Flores. Uh, she sings pop and trap in Quechua, 
But at the same time, she erases awareness. This is a quote from her when she says that Quechua is still perceived as a symptom of poverty. The other case is Liberato Cani, who is a hip hop Quechua singer and an activist as well. And he says that for him, Quechua is a language of resistance. And the same way uh, among young, urban and rural millennials or Gen Z, uh, we have the case of Solistcha, which is a rural um, uh, Quechua activist uh, who uses social media, TikTok, Instagram, to share about her language, but also about her culture. We also have to acknowledge that one example of discrimination um, was that in countries like Peru, where we had periods of violence, whenever violence happened, like in this case, uh, the violence during um, a time of uh, terrorism, according to Peru's Truth Commission, 75 of an approximate 69,000 uh, victims were made up according uh, to, to the Truth Commission by male and female peasants speaking a native language. Despite all of that harmful process, Quechua is still spoken by millions across the Andes. And this is an, um, a data from 2010. We have the, the number of speakers of Quechua in Peru. And then this one is from 2017. We see that there's an increase of uh, Quechua speakers. Is that because Quechua has more speakers now? No, but it's because one of the, the hypotheses is that there is less a stigma to admit that, uh, for people to admit that they speak the language. And if we look at as, um, the other um, uh, data image, we see that in the self-identification question for people in Peru, regardless if they speak the language or not, almost a quarter of Peruvians identify as Quechua. Outside of the region, then, Andean migrants and their descendants in the diaspora are also joining language and cultural reclamation efforts. By increasing its visibility, these activists demonstrate that Quechua is not only regional, but global. In the 1970s and 1980s, Andean immigrants fled violence and economic hardship in their home countries, flocking to urban regions in the US that faced a growing demand for factory workers. Andean enclaves emerged in major cities of the US, including Los Angeles, Miami, Washington DC, and New York. In the greater New York area, urban Peruvians and Ecuadorians established important settlements. Many of the Ecuadorians who migrated to New York City were indigenous people from Cañar and Azuay provinces, according to Yokish. Peruvians met the New York, New Jersey region and South Florida, their main destinations. Bolivians from the Quechua speaking region of Cochabamba gather in Northern Virginia near Washington DC, according to Strunk. And according to All People's Initiative, an estimated 10,000 Quechua speakers live in the New York metropolitan area alone. A side comment, it is also important to recognize that Quechua speakers also live in US rural spaces. In the 1970s, the US government made a deliberate effort to recruit Peruvians from mostly rural areas in the Andes to live and work in rural areas of the US, including the mountains of Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. These migrants, according to the research of my colleague, Alison Krogel, became sheep and alpaca shepherds and were likely Quechua speakers. Due to their geographical isolation, Information about these shepherds is limited, and we, but we know that working conditions have been and still are precarious. Going back to our 
topic today about urban spaces. While the initial goal of most Andean immigrants in New York City was economic stability, cultural organizations and initiatives gradually emerged, including dance groups, worker unions, restaurants, religious fraternities, and celebrations. Beyond their status as immigrants, Quechua speakers navigate a society that often considers them Hispanics or Latinos, pan-ethnic terms that erase cultural differences between Latin American countries. Quechua, Andean, and indigenous identities overlap and conflict with Latinidad and US Americanness. Andean migrants and their descendants negotiate identities and, I'm quoting from Privilsky, undergo a number of transformations and dislocations from their pre-migration lives. These spaces became important platforms for cultural promotion and production, transmitting traditions to new US-born generations. Of his experience, Quechua poet uh, Freddy Roncaya remarks, and I'm quoting, writing as an Andean thinker who lives in New York becomes an special situation. Being able to notice that over the ruins of peripheral modernity and beyond the nation state borders, Andean enclaves extend to these and other economic centers of the globalized world. Given that Quechua language projects continue to emerge and grow outside of Tahuantinsuyu, which is a traditional name for the lands that occupy the Inca Empire, we find it necessary to explore these diverse initiatives in the US and their connections with reclamation projects in the Andes, paying particular attention to New York City as a major center of Andean migration. Over the last two decades, several community initiatives and educational programs have emerged in New York City to teach Quechua and foster connections between language speakers and researchers in the US and the Andes. They challenge stereotypes of Quechua as a local language and assert its global presence in New York and beyond. These examples illustrate how Quechua language programming addresses issues of language access, for example, interpretation, creates a space for identity formation and expression, and engages with academia. These initiatives draw on various varieties of Quechua spoken in Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador, thereby suggesting a pan-Andean perspective that celebrates all varieties of the language and avoids assumptions that, as Coronel Molina has done research about, some people might only perceive or assume that there's just one best or purest version of Quechua. Since 2008, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at New York University has hosted Quechua language classes under the instruction of Peruvian professor, uh, Quechua professor, and poet Odi Gonzalez. While most students have an academic interest in the Andes, some have a personal connection with the language. The Quechua program serves as a training ground for educators and activists and as an incubator for projects and ideas. NYU, the space, the Quechua program uh, at that institution, provides a space for student-run activities, including the Quechua Night series, Rima Sun podcast and, and Runa Simi outreach committee, now called um, Collective. Beyond NYU, alumni of the Quechua program have worked with the Quechua Collective of New York, Quechua Hatari, and the Mai Sumac Quechua Film Festival, all of them initiative based in New York City. I'm going to speak about those initiatives. In 2012, Peruvian Quechua activist Elva Ambilla, along with NYU graduate students, started the Quechua Collective of New York. When Elva visited her neighborhood library in Brooklyn, a place where she has been living for the past 50 years, she was disappointed to find that there were no materials in Quechua. 
This experience fostered an interest in creating an organization to re revitalize um, this language. Well, membership initially comprised NYU students and alumni, the group now boasts in the UNIS activist students, allies. The collective executes various programs, including Raimi Sandinos, Bingo Nights, and language classes in partnerships with uh, non the nonprofit organization, the Endangered Language Alliance. In 2014, radio producer Segundo Anmarca, interpreter Luis Antonio Lema, and NYU alumnos Charlie Uruchima, who are all Quichua, Quechua, founded Quichua Hatari, the first US-based Quichua language radio program. Radio El Tambo Estéreo, Angamarca's internet radio station, hosts the program. Angamarca proposed a Quechua language radio program to create a space to discuss issues facing the Quechua community and build relationships between Quechua, Quechua speakers in Ecuador and in the US. The program, according to an article from New York Times, uh, has invited Quechua scholars, activists, and artists to participate in its broadcast. Quechua Hatari therefore maintains close ties to its counterparts in the Andes, discussing issue of significance for, in, to both communities. For instance, uh, they have hosted a, a a Congress candidates in Ecuador because Ecuadorians abroad are able to vote as well. Uh, so that's another way to um, bring uh, bridges and connections. In 2015, um, the, the NYU Center for Latin American uh, and Caribbean Studies, along with students from the Runasimi Outreach Committee, founded the My Suma Kichwa Film Showcase the first film festival to feature Quechua language cinema in the US. This annual gathering draw filmmakers from across the US and the Andes. My Sumac engages community members and students through film screenings, workshops, and discussions. In 2019, My Sumac expanded its reach beyond the US, holding screenings in Ecuador as well. I would like to also um, dedicate some time to the presence of Quechua university programs in the United States. Because beyond NYU, Stanford, the University of Pennsylvania, Ohio State, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, the University of Georgia, University of Texas, UCLA, Colorado at Boulder, currently offer Quechua language classes. Institutions of higher education can play an important role as a gateway between practitioners and scholars, as we can see with all of these um, projects that I have mentioned previously. Besides offering indigenous language classes, universities can help to promote debate and reflection on the relevance of indigenous languages. However, many of these universities depend on graduate students or US congressional funding from Title VI of the Higher Education Act to carry out their on their Quechua initiatives. As I mentioned in a, in a previous article that I published, this dependency puts Quechua classes in a precarious situation where at any time these programs could be terminated despite a growing interest in Andean topics and indigenous languages in academia. To make sure that Quechua language programs continue and break from the cyclical rise and fall of class offerings, offerings universities need to view them as a high priority and invest directly their funds. Outside of New York, there are also community outreach initiatives. In California, as you can also see in one of the flyers here, Stanford's University Cafecito Quechua hosts a small gatherings uh, where participants can learn Quechua and invites local Quechua speakers to share stories and songs. In addition to in-person projects, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated, accelerated the visibilization of social media initiatives. For example, the Quechua project. 
a Washington DC based collective that shares interactive content on Instagram for Andean youth in the US using English, Quechua and Spanish. The Quechua project be, uh, builds upon the efforts of first generation Bolivian immigrants in the DC area, including Julia Garcia, a retired Virginia a school teacher and director of Comité Pro Bolivia. Another social media initiative uh, based in the US is Quechuata Rimay, based in Tennessee and organized by Luz Merisa Vargas Saitupac. In addition to creating virtual educational content, Vargas Saidi Tupac has organized trilingual virtual gatherings on Andean culture. There are many of these initiatives and they have become uh, more visible, as you can see, through social media. To accommodate the attention to Quechua studies and initiatives, along with other colleagues and partners, this is something that I'm directly involved, we started to organize the first gathering of the Quechua Alliance at the University of Pennsylvania in 2015. This intergenerational gathering brings together Quechua language students, scholars and activists from across the US. Each year, the location changes in, for example, in, in 2017, it happened at NYU. In 2019, it happened at Ohio State University. In 2020, even though it was virtual, it was supposed to uh, happen uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and they still um, assisted with the organization uh, virtually. And then the audience grows. The intention is to celebrate Andean culture, showcase Quechua language initiatives, and promote collaboration among Quechua speakers, dance and, and also well by dancing, singing and connecting. So this is not just like a conference, but it's a space to build up community. In addition to its annual meeting, the Quechua Alliance recognizes US-based Quechua educators and language activists and has given awards for social media activists in Peru. For instance, recipients of Quechua Alliance US Quechua Lifetime Achievement Award are um, Clodoaldo Soto in 2015, who has been an educator and author uh, of Quechua manuals based in Illinois, Julia Garcia, the Virginia a school teacher and promoter of Quechua and Bolivian culture in the DC area, Quechua Hatari, the, the radio station that also uh, promotes community activities in 2017, Elva Ambia, the founder of the Quechua Collective of New York uh, in 2018, and in 2019, Luis Morato, uh, a professor of Quechua who used to teach at different US universities and and promoted Quechua language uh, for many decades. We can see that a common characteristic among these initiatives is the ongoing cultural exchange between the US-based programming and their counterparts in the US. In, I'm sorry, a common characteristic among these initiatives is the ongoing exchange between the US-based programming and their counterparts in the Andes. Quichua Hatari builds bridges between Quichua speakers in Ecuador and migrant communities in the US, discussing issues relevant to both communities. The Quechua Alliance facilitates connections between Quechua speakers in the US and Peru by inviting presenters and artists from the Andes to perform in the US, hence, this project's audience and influence are not limited to the US, but have implications for the language reclamation initiatives in the Andes. And to start to wrap up this conversation, for this presentation and, and for this forthcoming piece um, published with my colleague Rachel Sprouse, we argue 
that Quechua language reclamation initiatives in the diaspora are growing not as isolated projects, but in a constant collaboration with Andean-based programming and language policy and planning. Diasporic Quechua language initiatives serve their local immigrant communities while also join hemispheric conversations to advance the language. These language projects also facilitate, as Martinez and Train mentioned, identity-oriented experiences among participants, particularly US Latinx youth who are affirming their voices while navigating the challenges of a racialized society. Being, therefore, therefore being North American is no longer about passive adaptation, but about each person act actively bringing a part of their culture in order to build a multicultural society. Thus, the existence of Quechua initiatives in the global North becomes a powerful statement of their resistance, resilience, and community building capacity. Quechua then is way more than images from the past, such as the Incas or ruins such as Machu Picchu. Of course, they are part of the legacy, but Quechua is much more. It can also mean dancing at a Quechua retreat in Brooklyn, one of the most uh, popular musics uh, that people dance at those retreats in Brooklyn that I have participated is Pirwaya Pirwa. It sounds like this. And that can happen also in a Quechua retreat in Brooklyn or US born or people who live in the United States can also attend national and international gatherings through the Quechua Alliance and my sumac. By highlighting these initiatives, we reaffirm that then Quechua is a global language. We focused for this presentation and for the paper that will come, our analysis primarily in New York City as a, um, as a significant cultural cluster that has facilitated the incubation of various Quechua radio shows, community gatherings, and film projects. These efforts foster a more multicultural society where claiming multiple identities is no longer seen as a contradiction. As Professor Nancy Hornberger uh, argues, argues, working with indigenous languages is, and I'm quoting, is not about bringing a language back, but rather bringing it forward. Therefore, these initiatives allow Quechua languages and particularly their speakers to continue advancing wherever they go in the Andes and beyond. Thank you, Anyai. Thank you very much, America. This has been fascinating. Thank you for the effort in, in putting all this information together in such a clear and well-organized way because you've touched on so many different topics and so many different aspects of linguistic and, and, and social and identity factors. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? May I, can I invite anybody to ask a first question? There are no questions in the chat so far, so maybe I, I can ask a question to break the ice. Um, I was very interested in what you explained to us about how the, the concept of otherness that Quechua communities experience in their home countries, uh, they are the other to other Peruvians or to other uh, Bolivians. Uh, but when they come to the US, 
if I understood correctly, they, uh, they are kind of merged or ab absorbed by this, this concept of, of Hispanics and, and, uh, and, uh, and the Latino community or the Latinx community. Um, and I wonder how, uh, what happens to this, uh, these, these two views, this opposition between the views of Quechua, of the Quechua language that you also mentioned um, from different, exemplified by different uh, artists. There was one singer, I think, that said that uh, Quechua, the Quechua language was a symbol of poverty, yeah. As opposed to a, a rap artist, a rap singer, I think, who said that for him, the Quechua language was a language of resistance. So I, I was, I'm, I'm connecting the two things in case you could relate them, you know, that uh, the, are these views also um, changed uh, in when, you know, when we, could, when we consider them in the context of the US? Uh, is, there, is there one of the two views that predominates in the US? How are they affected by their, the new context? To sum up. Thank you. I think the, the thank you for that question. The, the migration process, I would say that adds another layer of complexity. And within that uh, situation, it can, that it can happen, it can go both ways. Like on one hand, the uh, it's not like they choose to be Hispanic or Latino because whenever they have to fill out any government form or any classification, they will automatically receive the, um, the, the label of Latino. And for example, a, a very clear example uh, of that contradiction happens with many migrants from Central America who many of them, they don't speak Spanish, but as soon as they, they might speak one of the Maya languages, and as soon as they cross and they come to the United States, they are counted as a Hispanic. And, and, and I think that um, uh, at the end of the day, it depends on the agency of the, the communities and the people, because they might understand that there is space for either get a voice or just navigate the classification of society is to uh, embrace Latinidad or, or Hispanic um, labels. But for other people, it might it could be both. It could be at the end, it's an umbrella term that they might see that is is, is how the U.S. sees them, but also uh, is a is a place of community gathering because there uh, people can gather. For example, if I can think of the experience of many people who, before coming to the U.S., they didn't feel that there was a connection between other countries. So also, just the dynamics of the space can prompt people to to embrace uh, Latinidad. So I would say it could go both ways, but certainly it's a contradiction in the making up to now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. There are three yeah. questions now. Let me start with the first one, David Lucchetti. Uh, oh, yes, and, oh, and, and oh, sorry, I think there's people who raise their hands before. Yeah, I but wanted... I think it was, it was David Lucchetti's turn first. If you, okay, if you, perfect. Uh, yeah? okay. I'll just read, you, read his question to you and then we'll ask, uh, Daniela and Jorge to ask her own questions themselves. Is that okay? Yeah. So David yes, Lupetti's question is, what are some, way, some ways white co-resistors can support these communities and resistance efforts? Thank you. I think one way is uh, to learn more about that and to, to understand uh, this uh, overlooked cultures uh, uh, not just as things from the past, but from, from a more complex uh, perspective. Uh, the same way as when we think about, let's say, any person who is learning French knows that automatically by learning the language, you are accessing uh, culture, literature, history. Uh, sometimes that's not the same assumption when learning an indigenous language or understanding that the traditions that come from those communities uh, can be also embedded in traditions of knowledge. Uh, actively ask for uh, recognitions of, of, um, of indigenous voices and, uh, and even let's say concretely for the US space, uh, I think uh, spaces where people are gathering to, to promote indigenous culture is a celebration of indigenous people's days. 
those are now spaces where many ideas are happening, where many community building is happening, and where everyone also can learn from indigenous leaders who attend there. So by listening more, thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's Daniela and uh, uh turn now. Daniela, go, you can go ahead. Mm. Imanaya Meriko, Daniela Mikani, Kaisumak, Rimana Kuimanta, Yupaichani. And thank you very much for this talk. Um, I am from Ecuador and I am really interested in your topic. And this was a really great overview of what is going on in the US. Uh, actually, uh, right now I am living in, in Amherst, Massachusetts. And I just wanted to tell an anecdote because I was walking down the streets here in Amherst and suddenly I saw a Quichua church uh, in the street. And because I read Quichua, I was, uh, oh my God, this is so interesting because it has to be Ecuadorians. And of course I enter and it's like uh, 100 families that attend to this ethnic uh, church here in the, in the community. And I wanted to know if you have seen um, this, this Quichua churches around, the, around Western Massachusetts. There are plenty also in New Jersey, also in New York. And I don't know if there is a difference between uh, what is happening with all the instances where there is like language revitalization efforts uh, regarding Quechua and these ethnic churches. Like, I am very curious if you have seen something about that. Yupachani, Mashi Daniela, thank you. Thank you for, for your question. And yes, you know, for, for, the, for this event that we have been organizing since 2015, the Quechua Alliance, um, we have had people coming from Massachusetts to the events in Philadelphia. Uh, and they, as you mentioned, they do organize through uh, evangelical churches and they do have services in Quechua. And, uh, and now that I, I am sort of new to the area of Massachusetts and mm -hmm. I'm starting to connect with some uh, people in the area, I've been meeting with uh, school teachers and they tell me that the demographics of many uh, uh, Latino, Latinx uh, school districts are changing rapidly. In, in the area of Massachusetts, it is, it is considered that most of the Latinx community comes from Dominican and, and Puerto Rican background, but now it's dramatically changing into Ecuadorian Quechua and uh, Guatemala and Maya. Yes, uh, yes. So, so yes, we, we need to reach out more and, and hopefully uh, map and, and learn from them to see the best ways of uh, support them. Yes, uh, I, I think, I, I, and, and just to finish with that aspect, uh, we, need, um, we need more intergenerational communication because as mm -hmm. you mentioned, there are the older generation, they might do have the knowledge or the expertise but they might not necessarily be in the ongoing conversations of identity search or identity politics that are happening a lot. Those that is happening a lot among the youth. Um, spaces like I would say Kichwa Hatari or the Quechua Alliance or other groups, uh, do, I think they do a very useful work on putting different generations together. Thank yes, you. absolutely. And it's also like with the minority languages, like people here suddenly looks at Spanish as the minority language and they want, at least with this community, but they don't look at Quechua as the language they want their children to learn. And mm -hmm. yes, yeah, as you say, they need more support in doing that. And uh, that would be amazing. But I'll let uh, everyone else speak. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. There are a few more hands raised. So now I think it's Jorge's turn. Jorge Sanchez Pere. Rimei Kujeki, Americo. Sutimi, Jorge. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I, I wanted to pick your brain. I'm a, a Peruvian as well, uh, as Peruvian as a potato, <laughs> as, we, as we usually say. Uh, I want to pick your brain because I, I also went to San Marcos uh, for one of my degrees and I did philosophy there. And what I've noticed sometimes is that in Latin America, the idea of Latin America or Latin, being Latin American or Latinx and being mestizo is used as a way to hide or eliminate the idea of indigeneity. Mm -hmm. As in, you're mestizo because you're closer to white, but you shouldn't mention that you're, in my case, like you're also part black and part indigenous, right? It's, it's many times used as a coping mechanism to hide the idea of indigeneity in the background. 
and in philosophy as well, the, the most in San Marcos University, which is the oldest functioning university in the American continent, I only had a couple of mentions in philosophy about Andean thought, right? Because, and the, the closest we got was some mentions to, to Mariategui, who is trying to bridge Andean thought with Marx's views. Uh, but again, it seems like Latinidad and mestizaje are used many, in many occasions, even in, in Quechua, in parts of the world where Quechua is highly, highly present, to hide indigeneity. Um, I found more, more accommodations in Canada to work on, on Quechua manuscripts like from the 15th century than I found in Peru, where I was literally told, that's not really philosophy. Why would you do that? Well, in Canada, they're like, yes, we will pay you to do a postdoc to, to tell me how this document can give us some philosophical insights. So, you know, uh, these tensions that I see happening, do you have an idea of how to approach them? Have you noticed them as well? Uh, Anyai. Anyai, Imainai, and Wahi, thank you. Thank you for your question. I, um, I, I would say that, uh, well, that, that would be a very long conversation. But just to point out some, some aspects, uh, actually, I'm, I'm working right now a piece with uh, another colleague, Mariel Quesada, um, about this tradition that you mentioned that in Latin America, the term mestizo or mestizaje uh, acknowledges a kind of like post-colonial mixed heritage. Uh, but on the other hand, you, you have other traditions or, or thinkers like Bolivian scholar Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui who criticize and says that mestizaje tends to dilute, as you mentioned, indigenous cultures, or I, we couldn't even say black cultures, like anti-blackness as well, right? In favor of uh, European or Spanish uh, cultures. But, but she, she and there are other scholars who work on that topic, but Rivera Cusicanqui offers the, uh, like a term called cheje, which is a term in Aymara, language that, that comes not just uh, like conceptually, but from indigenous practices, the, the, the way on how textiles are woven in the Andes, which from far away, they, those textiles might look gray, but as we approach them, we can see the individual black and white threads of which they are composed. Uh, and, 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 and like acknowledging that it's not just diluted, but then starting to identify things uh, in, a, in a more critical way uh, can be an important step. So certain, and, and that, gets also translated into US Latinidad. Uh, there are different movements who are questioning the, 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 the relevance of Latinidad. And, um, and then, uh, but uh, there are other groups who, again, because they, they see that that's how the label is there right now, and maybe it might change in the future, but, but they also propose to expand uh, the notions of Latinidad to be more inclusive for indigenous and, and, and black identities. And, and just in case the word, because I see in, in the in, on the chat, the word is Cheje, but I would recommend you to look for the uh, work of Rivera Cusicanqui, uh, the Bolivian scholar. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have three more hands, but I think the first one is we'll force somebody called Sankai. We can't see their face, but you can. You can ask your question now if you're ready. Sankai. Imainayan Ayilanchu. Hola, Américo. Ah, Imainayan Irma. Estoy desde un teléfono que no puedo y recién pude entrar a escucharte. Quería mediante ti primero decirte gracias por esta gran charla que acabas de dar, pero también quería acotar que es tan importante y y es un llamado a la comunidad, en realidad, a la comunidad de Massachusetts, a la comunidad de, de Harvard, a los académicos, a los peruanos, a los ecuatorianos, bolivianos, a los quechua, quechua, arunas, para ver que aparte de únicamente teorizar eh, y a, aparte de únicamente de verlo desde el ámbito académico, ¿qué podríamos hacer nosotros? Soy una de las personas que, que me gusta eh, hacer directamente algo directamente a hacer, como diríamos en quechua, a Yank, a Uruguay, ¿no? De frente. Y nada, solamente eso, ¿no? Agradecerte primero a ti y segundo, mediante ti, preguntar si dentro de los participantes están alguien dispuesto a aportar con ideas de qué, qué más podríamos hacer. 
¿no? Para nosotros, para nuestra cultura, para, para seguir llevando adelante también esta, esta lengua quechua. Eso no más. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, well, I'll quickly translate. Uh, this is uh, my, my friend Irma Alvarez Cosco. She's a Quechua poet and also an activist. She's based in, in New England, in Rhode Island. And, and she's asking like always like to have that question of like going beyond uh, theory, which uh, I think is a, is a, is a good, uh, uh, it's a good thing to always have present. Uh, I, I tried at least for this talk to also invite you for those who are not familiar, not just on like theoretical reflections on, on Quechua uh, migration, but I also point out to some initiatives that are happening and I would invite you to get in touch with them uh, and, and get to know them and learn for their work. Um, and hopefully also in the Massachusetts area, we can expand and replicate their efforts. Thank you. Okay, so we have B Cunningham uh, with his hand raised as well. So, so go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Americo, uh, very much for this talk. This has been absolutely fantastic. And thank you for everyone for, um, for asking questions as well. This is, um, I am very excited to hear all of this. I am a high school teacher in the Massachusetts area in Brockton. And I teach beginner ESL, so many of my students are coming in from the Cañar uh, region in Ecuador. And, um, and I have also uh, been doing work in Ecuador as well to kind of just connect with where they're coming from. And what I've noticed is that exactly what, what you have been talking about and what, what um, other people have been sharing, that um, there is this um, reluctance to identify uh, in a new context as indigenous or as um, Andean even, um, and to shy away from Quechua and to just um, to fly under the radar, I guess, um, by speaking Spanish and, and, and taking on the uh, Latino Latinx um, label. Uh, however, when, there, when my you know, students are presented with resources in Quechua, they light up, they, they, they want to engage because they're being recognized um, and, it's, and they're being shown that it's a safe place. However, it's, um, you know, of course, all this work that I started doing um, was in 2018, 2019. And of course, when uh, uh, the pandemic hit, a lot of, um, you know, it was a lot harder to connect um, face to face with students, of course. Um, so now that things are starting <laughs> to normalize, I'm, I'm hoping to do a lot more work. Um, we were working on a, um, a Quechua phrase book uh, for the students and trying to raise um, um, just their, their profile, the, their indigenous profile within the school context because they keep, again, they're just the Spanish speakers. And um, it goes, uh, it, it's very um, flattening of their, their um, um, this, this single story that just flattening their, their identities. And um, again, that was put on hold and I'm hoping to um, connect more. So I would love to, um, um, I would love to share my email uh, in the chat. If anyone who would like to connect, who would like to, um, I, I also love the fact going beyond the theory, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a PhD student also um, working in this area in, the, in social identity and I'm, I'm but the theory, has to work for our communities and work for um, especially, um, um, you know, helping um, these these adolescents navigate not just um, not just two but three or or more identities um, as they uh, come into this context. So again, thank you so much uh, for for your talk and for everyone being here. So thanks. Thank you, thank you for sharing and, and thank you for the work you're doing uh, with students. Uh, as, as you mentioned, it's, it's important to create, uh, let's say, the structure, right? Uh, either spaces or using tools that can also be relevant for them. For instance, something that I, uh, when I uh, used to work at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with the Quechua program, something that we, we realized that became very useful before, be, besides the offering of classes, is to create an environment of cultural activities that would um, I'm not a fan of saying that that would normalize 
the like the same way as let's let's say if they're an event of like I don't know Italian music nobody thinks it's weird right it's, of course a university has to have events like that but when you think about Quechua or Maya that's not um, that's more uncommon and there that should be part of the holistic education not just for of course thinking on Quechua students but for everyone. Uh, to, to have the same value of, of that. And um, so for sure, I, I would love to connect with you and, 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 and see how we can collaborate. Uh, I've, been, I've been contact also by um, a teacher from the Lawrence district uh, with similar um, questions about that. So it seems that we can share some efforts. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got Cunningham's uh, contact details in the chat now. And also Jennifer Albarracin has, uh, has typed the name of the project, of the Quechua project that was mentioned before. So I think we can now invite Luis Gonzalez Kitspe to, to ask uh, his question. So thank you for participating. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And um... I'm Nadia Yachatika Mariko Yupaichani for for the presentation given today, and I definitely could relate very much with uh, the discussion in regards to indigeneity in the diaspora. Um, as a Kichwa Saraguro, having been born and raised in this diasporic context, it definitely is of relevance for me um, as a way to reclaim my my language, essentially Kichwa, um, and. It's, it's, it's a struggle, I would say, but it's definitely something that I feel um, is part of me, my, my identity in, in a way that I am trying to go forth with that. Um, but with that said, um, my question is regards more so to the geographic context of what, um, in this case of uh, identity and language reclamation. Um, um, as uh, just a little bit about myself or my, my community. Um, so there is a, uh, I would say quite a significant um, Quechua Saraguro based um, uh, communities that reside here in the rural Wisconsin region. Um, I'm here at UW Madison. Um, and um, I would also say Quechua Kanyar people are also existing within the Minneapolis or rural uh, Minnesota regions as well. So, with that said, um, I just wanted to ask in uh, if you had first done any look into uh, rurality as it connects to indigeneity and uh, cultural and language reclamation within those regions. Um, and if so, have you seen any sort of um, differences between, I know you focus mostly on the urban locations, but if you've seen anything, um, any different perhaps stories in regards to the urban versus rural. Thank you. You, Paichani. Paichani, Mashi Luis, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning of, of my talk, uh, my colleague, uh, Alison Krochel has done research about uh, 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 alpaca and sheep shepherds in the states of Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. Uh, but yes, there's there's a need of more work and recognition. Uh, that the one of uh, I am not familiar in the case of uh, uh, Ecuadorians, but <laughs> for ex but for example, something that uh, uh, should be. Um, sh uh, even, even let's say even the Peruvian government doesn't have a, an important presence in terms of like consulate offices there, so so there's uh, there's not not, not much data, um, but right now uh, Alison Krochel is doing research and collaboration uh, there. She she would be a good resource. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? I'd like to ask you a question, another question, Americo. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk, the different, oh, there are two questions. Okay, I'll just finish my question quickly. Um, that there are several communities and, and they, they've just been mentioned uh, throughout the, the US of Quechua communities. I'd like to ask you whether, uh, whether there are any noticeable difference, differences between this, these communities, for example, in, ter for example, in terms of assimilation is one community more assimilated or less or the, in terms of how or to what extent extent the different communities keep preserve their Quechua language and, and, and traditions or whether different varieties of Quechua predominate in the different communities in, in Washington, New York or Minnesota or 
are there any noticeable differences between them, be them linguistic or social or economic, even political? Are, are they more active in certain places than in others? Thank you. Uh, I would say that in the case of um, the, uh, and I hope to do more research about this, but in the case of the Bolivian community in the DC area, is clearly the uh, most of the people uh, who are Quechua speakers are from the Cochabamba region, and therefore most of the festivities resemble festivities from that particular region, and therefore the the, the promotion and the use of the language uh, is the, the the Cochabamba region or the Valle Alto. Um, a Quechua uh, uh, type, uh, which is also part of the Southern Quechua, which is the bigger regional type. I, uh, in the case of Peruvians, I would say that um, the majority of, of uh, Peruvians living in the United States come from bigger coastal cities. And therefore most of the narrative of Peruvian identity is more, it, it, my my put Quechua on a second level, and therefore I I I I I, I would argue that uh, that's why whenever I see more clear Quechua um, uh, reclamation processes, uh, uh, I tend to see that it, it comes more from Ecuadorian and Bolivian communities, maybe because of the, because the majority of these communities, especially these particular pockets from uh, Cañar or Azuay in the case of Ecuador or the case of Bolivia in Cochabamba, they are from Quechua majority uh, regions. While in the case of Peru, they may be from cities like Lima or Trujillo or Callao where Quechua uh, is not spoken or, or as I mentioned, even though with half a million people, the, the narrative was towards the, like portraying Quechua in a, in a negative in a negative way. But at the same time, um, spaces like New York City, uh, because of there's this convergence of different Quechua speakers, then, then that prompts to, to highlight more of that aspect and, and also to create a more regional uh, sense of pride. Because sometimes even between, as I quickly mentioned, but like Professor, uh, Professor Serafin Coronel Molina has done research on, on even the, the conflict of Quechua speakers arguing about which Quechua is better. And suddenly in the US, they are like, okay, I mean, here is senseless. We're, we need to get together and, and actually celebrate this diversity of varieties. Thank you. Okay. So it's got some positive impact as well. Right, so we've got two more questions. So Silvia de la Sota, you can go ahead. Hi. Um, uh, hola, Américo. Hola, ¿qué tal? Hi, Américo. Um, I uh, wanted to, I am Peruvian um, from Lima, and my parents uh, immigrated um, Lima in the early 70s, and they, they never, um, from the Andes, and they never, um, there was a lot of discrimination, so they, they didn't make an effort to teach us Quechua. So I would like to know um, if you, Americo, recommend uh, an application. Are you going to teach Quechua in Harvard? Um, I would like to take it through the extension school. Well, thank you for that question. So, um, and now that you, you are talking about your own story, right? Of that, like, like let's say many indigenous languages are no longer spoken, not not because of an accident, but because even parents or grandparents, in order to protect their children from that discrimination, they don't teach the language. They want, they're one, and that comes from the idea that indigenous languages, even for speakers of those languages, are seen as something from the past. So they see on their kids, I want them to give them, I want to give them the best. I want the best for their future. Quechua is not picturing that future. We need to change that um that narrative and um and i and i and i like that there are indigenous scholars not just quechua but for example the case of wesley leonard who is uh from the miami tribe of oklahoma and he works a lot with this with the notion of language reclamation instead of language revitalization because the reclamation that the word reclamation puts the emphasis on on on, on 
on community goals and community needs and, and how through that process there is also empowerment. Um, there are, uh, uh, to answer the other part of your, of your comment, your question, uh, I'm hoping, yes, next semester I'll be offering a, a class on language uh, revitalization and reclamation and Quechua. So we'll be up at Harvard, so we will have a both like a language and theoretical component. There are also many resources, for example, uh, just to mention again, to to recognize the work of the Quechua project that they are on Instagram. There are also um, uh, YouTubers and uh, who have uh, programs of Quechua, such as Quechua Studio, for example, um, which are there available uh, and, and, and then activities by uh, Quechua Tarima or or um or different other other fo folks. They, unfortunately, there's no like a Duolingo version for Quechua yet. But there, but on YouTube, there are you, uh, people uploading content as well. Thank you. Gracias, gracias, Silvia. Thank you, thank you both. That was a very practical question and practical answer. I'm, I'm sure it's useful for many of the people present here today. So that we have an two more questions, I think, or oh, one question and one comment. So, as, so we've got Luz Merisa Vargas waiting to be invited to ask a question. You can go ahead now. Imainaya Inyacho, Imainaya Turi Americo. Uh, how are you? Uh, thank you for this space. I, I just want to thank you so much for the amazing presentation. And I really value this space. Um, I am originally from Huancavelica, um, so I promote also Quechua. I am um, uh, my Instagram is uh, Quechua Tarima, as America mentioned. So for me, as a Quechua speaker, it's uh, very important to have these spaces so we can uh, share information. And I think America uh, has done a very uh, um, good job, and um, I really appreciate your work. Um, what you do and uh, for me also when I am outside from my community I try to uh, keep speaking Quechua and unfortunately as a Quechua speaker I have not learned how to write so that's what I'm doing right now uh, trying to learn how to write so I can be able to be more helpful uh, for my community and also for anyone who is interested on in learning Quechua. And I just wanted to thank you everyone for the interested and I thank you to Ria Americo uh, for this amazing work you do. Chai am chai. Anyai. Sulpai kipani chai luz. She, as she mentioned, she is doing this fantastic work on Quechua Tarrimay through social media. Uh, she's based in Tennessee. And, and I think um, also I'm glad that she shared some of the nuances of, of the, just the, the challenges that the language has within their home country, such as like the lack of, uh, there, I mean, there are standardized writing ways, but many speakers of the language uh, didn't have the opportunity to use them. Um, so, and that also represents a challenge when passing on the language to new generations as well, because we are more on a reading based system. Well, uh, well, um, Quechua works more in the or within the oral platforms, but, but at the same time that this can be an invitation for us to don't just fall into the assumptions that written things are better because then if, if we have that assumption then we might hear people uh, which it, it have it happens uh, even today that they might consider Quechua less quote-unquote civilized than other languages just because there is no like in a standardized use of of the language and uh, and I think the work just to expand a bit more on the work of uh, of Luz Merisa Vargas and other people like the Quechua Project uh, from DC, uh, they are exploring social spaces, virtual spaces, social media, uh, which right now are the places where the youth are 
and they are interacting. And, and sometimes, I mean, the older we get, the less we feel like, you know, we know those, how to navigate those spaces. But that doesn't mean that those can be meaningful spaces as well. So I really appreciate the work that they, these initiatives are doing uh, because they understand those spaces and they are building bridges in an intergenerational way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chayanne. Thank you, America. There's one comment by Cady de la Cruz, just a comment, a comment saying her, that her father is limeño and, and she had the same experience versus Quechua as Silvia, uh, uh, the, the person who mentioned that she wasn't taught Quechua by, by her parents. And, and Kelly say, says that she now speaks mainly English, probably because of that. So we have another question, maybe the last question by Eva Mulbauer. So thank you very much, Eva. You can ask me. Uh, thanks very much for your speech, for your presentation. Um, so I just wanted to uh, refer back to a question we had before about how we can help about, um, well, um, so Americo said we could promote uh, several initiatives and um, so I'm forming part of uh, an initiative called Yamacha, which is relatively new, um, which uh, first and foremost um, is working on the development of linguistic technologies such as automatic speech recognition and translation and so on, which is also a very, very important step to include uh, Quechua in this globalized world and in this digital world um, of the internet. And so it can have more presence everywhere and also um, to make it possible to, um, to, uh, yeah, to give, uh, Mm, services to uh, Quechua speaking people, for example, in Peru, um, to make it possible to facilitate commu communication with enterprises or um, in the justice system or what, wherever it's needed, you know. Um, so uh, a way to help for native speakers of Quechua would be, for example, to help uh, build an audio corpus, a speech corpus um, with the Pukarik um, application. I'll write the name here, Pukarik. Um, so there you can basically, you will be able to listen to sentences in Quechua, mostly taken from dictionaries. And uh, then you can um, record your own, uh, your own voice. <laughs> and um, this will help uh, to Mm, grow the corpus and this will help uh, the technology to become more uh, accurate um, every time and um, more and more accurate the, the bigger the corpus grows so this would be one one other way to help as well and um, we also talked about Duolingo um, so this is obviously also an important um, platform on the internet where um, Quechua should definitely be represented as well. And I remember that years ago, uh, I completely on my own um, try, uh, submitted um, uh, an application to, uh, to the Duolingo incubator for Quechua. And at that time, my Quechua was probably still not, not enough to do that anyways, but I, I wanted to try it anyways, and they never responded, uh, no answer whatsoever. And over the years, I've witnessed some other groups trying to do the same thing. And um, uh, even uh, with much more involvement of native speakers as well. And uh, it, it's not been recognized so far. So maybe another way to do something for Quechua um, also as um, as a um, white uh, co resistant or I, I don't remember exactly how that was phrased, but um, something that anybody can do is try to put some pressure um, on Duolingo and let them know that many people are interested in learning Quechua. It's not just uh, 
Spanish speakers in uh, the countries where Quechua is spoken mainly, but also um, in the US and in many other countries around the globe. So um, yeah, to just let them know that uh, there is a real demand and that they should finally um, recognize all of the submissions to, to include it there. Mm -hmm. thank, uh, you. thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's just uh, somebody, Christina Ore has offered her detail, contact details as well for, for anybody interested in, in establishing contact for collaboration. Uh, and and yeah. uh, somebody asked if it's from the project uh, where I, it's Siminchi uh, Kunaraiku. That's the former name of the project. Uh, yes, that um, uh, the app was developed within this project, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you would like to add anything, Americo. To... Yes. Well, thank you, thank you, Eva and uh, I, uh, I basically, well, Eva, Eva is showing like this. I, I, I like that she pointed out to a project that is not necessarily connected with the humanities or social sciences, uh, because it's a, it's a, 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 I do social science and humanities, but, but that's another way to show that from like STEM or coding. Um, there can be contributions to the language. Basically, it's a data it's a database that they're creating, so they then cre they can create infrastructure for things such as Google Translate or 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 act out, uh, artificial intelligence like Siri. But for that, uh, they need to collect data and create those apps. Um, and, and and they do a fantastic work. There, I didn't mention that because they're based in Peru. I mean, they work with people across the world, but they are. This is a U.S. Ba a based a, a Peru-based initiative, but but of course they do have uh, influence uh, in different places, and you should look that up. Thank you. Um, so just to, um, I'll also include the name of the current um, initiative uh, called Yamacha. Um, so we are based all around the globe, basically. Um, in Spain, uh, some of us are in Spain, and uh, then there's uh, Carlos Molina Vital, um, who is teaching Quechua at, um, in, in Illinois. Um, so, yes. Um, and Siminchi Kunaraiko, yes, is based in Peru. Yeah, and Sanka is point, pointing out that there are many other software projects, uh, she says. Just to finish, I was wondering, uh, going back to what you said a couple of minutes ago, um, Americo, about Quechua being fairly or, un or unfairly considered traditionally more of an oral language than a written language, I was wondering whether that may explain why some of the posters and the flyers that you showed us, uh, um, because I noticed it, uh, of, of the Quechua Hatari project, the entrevistas and other things, I noticed they were either bilingual English Spanish or just monolingual Spanish. I think they mm -hmm. were never bilingual Quechua Spanish. There was never any Quechua in the poster or in the flyer, and I noticed that because of my translation research background. And I was going to ask you about that, but then you you've just mentioned this this fact, and maybe it's got to do with that. Do you think it's got to do with this difficulty of the? Quechua written language or the, the fact that many people do, who speak it don't write it? It could be, there, there are many, thank you for that. That's a very important question and thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, some, uh, the nature of orality could be one factor. The other thing is that many Quechua speakers, uh, my, the ones who are able to read, they might use different writing methods so whenever, so sometimes relying on Spanish and English might be the safest choice. And the other hand is that many of these events are open to people in different stages of the language. So they, they probably want to reach out also to people who don't speak the language, but they, they want to claim it as part of their, their heritage. Um, but for example, when we, we have done some, some calls within the Quechua Alliance and we try to have them trilingual, Quechua, English, and Quechua as well. But, but, but for, I guess for these uh, events, it makes more sense to have it bilingual. And, and I would like to uh, also add that um, someone on the chat said that uh, despite their heritage, they were not able to speak the language. And um, 
And, uh, and I understand that not everyone who was born or grew up in the United States uh, might have the resources or the time or for any other factors to learn the language and speak it fluently. But even appreciating words and acknowledging the, the, the heritage and the traditions of knowledge is an important step. I always point out that in the US, people love to use words in Latin, quid pro quo, things like that. And, and why do, do we do that? We do that uh, because that's a way, I guess, from the, let's say, legal system or the official system to acknowledge a tradition of a system of, uh, um, that is behind that word. Because we could easily use a translation in English, but why do we keep it in, in Latin or, or certain words in French? Because that's our unconscious or conscious way to recognize those different legacies by learning and embracing and appreciating terms in, in Quechua or Maya or Nahuatl, we can also uh, pay respect and, and, and bring those concepts to, to contemporary conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, America. It's been a fascinating talk. Thank you for accepting our invitation to open up this, this, this uh, really complex uh, topic, which, which uh, 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 yeah, embraces uh, issues relating to language, to, to history, to, to culture, to, to society, to, to politics and power. Huh? So I'm sure, I'm sure they will, this will not be the last. This will be the first, the first event that we will be devoting to Quechua and other indigenous language, languages and, and communities. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for your presence here today. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you again in another event by the Observatorio. Um, so see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Americo. Thank you.